was a great privilege to present the petroleum resources of the Great American Carbon Aid Bank to the North American group of the HGS on April 25, 2011. HDS asked me to record this presentation so that future explorers could study and become more familiar with the material. This paper came about as an APG memoir on the Great American Carbonate Bank as a tribute to the great carbonate geologist James Lee Wilson. And I was very fortunate to be asked to write the petroleum chapter. This memoir is due out in 2012 and you can see James Lee Wilson is on the right of the screen. The main part of this talk, the important thing to remember about this talk is that we have a hundred years of exploration history for the Great American Carbonate Bank and the purpose is to take these insights and lessons for the explorers of today so that they can use them going forward for future exploration. And I knew to do this chapter we had to have good up-to-date production information and IHS obliged us by sharing their vast production databases. Most of the production is in the mid-continent but it's clear that the Great American Carbonate Bank is a continental wide carbonate bank that extends into Canada and Greenland. One of the main things about the reservoirs in the Great American Carbonate Bank is that they are part of a larger petroleum system with source rocks and seal in strata that are not of the uh, Great American Carbonate Bank but that are juxtaposed by faults and impinged upon by onlapping of the unconformity and various configurations. So it's very critical to understand much more than the carbonate bank to understand the petroleum system. The early workers on unconformities, particularly Leverson and Sloss, noted that unconformities had profound impacts on hydrocarbons. And I would like to coin the phrase unconformity thinking here to acknowledge this importance because it's very clear that the predominant oil and gas production out of the Cambro Ordovician reservoirs, the majority of the production is associated with the unconformity. And the early workers in Leverson's 1943 paper recognized clastic systems had inherent porosity changes at unconformities that there were pressure differentials that could attract and affect the way hydrocarbons uh, migrated and that old traps or paleogeomorphic traps had the opportunity to get many charge pathways and therefore a favored situation. But these were basically observations about siliclastic carbonate systems and the Great American Carbonate Bank is a carbonate that is greatly uh, dissolved and karstified and fractured by this unconformity. So when we're talking about the Great American Carbonate Bank unconformity, the carbonates add an entire new dimension. This shows the middle portion of the carbonate bank that is uh, with the dolomite pattern and the limestone pattern where the majority of production occurs and the explorer today will recognize uh, the reservoir names, the Ellenberger, the Arbuckle, the Knox, the Prairie du Chien and the Beekman Town. So when we say Great American Carbonate Bank we are referring to all of these very common oil and gas reservoir names. This strat chart by Bill Morgan, one of the co-editors of the volumes, very nicely shows that the unconformity is a major hiatus at around the 472 million year boundary and that the rocks that we're going to be referring to vary from 472 million to 488 million as the lower Ordovician and that the upper and middle Cambrian uh, component of this includes rocks as old as 513 million years. 
And this chart is an amazing accomplishment by Bill Morgan because what it does is it compiles the stratigraphic units all across North America and gives uh, the cycles and the age equivalencies. The volume that's in preparation uh, has about 30 chapters on local areas and you can see how far ranging these chapters are. The big picture, as I like to call it, is we can see in the middle of the midcontinent of North America what I call the breadbasket by the light blue area but it's clear that the extent of the carbonate bank goes into far into Canada and also into Greenland. This zoom in of the midcontinent of the US highlights the oil and gas production with red and yellow colors being fields that are the richest and notably they occur in the Permian Basin and in the uh, central Kansas uplift but also there's quite a bit of green uh, which represents green and yellow that represent production in Kansas, Oklahoma and uh, up into the Appalachians, Ohio and Michigan. Reviewing the production there's about 3650 fields that produce oil and gas from Cambria Audivision reservoirs and 4.1 billion barrels is oil and 21 TCF is gas and it includes some gas giant fields. Taken together in barrels oil equivalency this is about 7.7 .7 billion barrels so it's clear that this is a very significant uh, stratigraphic unit. And since the majority of the oil and gas equivalent is oil, 57 percent, it's timely to revisit these under current scenarios of high oil prices. As we look at the 30 basins that produce from the Cambrian Ordovician or the Great American Carbonate Bank Reservoirs, it's clear on the far left the two basins dominate, the Permian Basin and the Central Kansas Uplift, where Permian Basin has 5 billion barrels equivalent production and Central Kansas Uplift has 2 billion barrels. So these are clearly uh, the dominant players. There's about a dozen fields that have 10 to 100 million barrels of production and on the far right there are a handful of fields that have uh, lesser amounts of production and if you're an optimist as I am these are potentially underexplored areas. And looking at the basins by the number of fields once again the central Kansas uplift Permian Basin dominate uh, on the left and I call your attention to several areas on the right that have um, a very few fields and uh, once again I would offer that they may be possibly underexplored areas. This is a um, diagram that shows all of the fields represented by a black line it is a by percentile. So, for example, of the the straight average of the 7.7 .7 billion barrels, 3,650 fields is about 2.1 million barrels of field. But the reality is that there are some very large giants that dominate the production, and there are very many small fields. So. The average, straight average, does not work well in understanding these fields in aggregate or as we look at any one of the individual basins, which are shown here uh, by the various colored lines. Just to get a global view of the reservoir that affects the production, the cyan in the middle of the continent represents dolomite and as we go to A, that's up. That's a very up dip reservoir position. So there's a lot of interbedded sandstones and dolomites. And as we work down through the midcontinent, it's the reservoirs are almost entirely dolomite. In the distal portions of the production, as we get to the south, they become more limestone rich. And as we go off ramp, 
they uh, become uh, more distal. So we'll look at a composite section, if you will, from A up dip to C prime down dip. And these are three separate sections that are put together. The red line represents the Knox on conformity, and that is um, a stratigraphic reference point. And we can see that the dolomite is cyan, and the interbeds of sandstone and dolomite are, occur in an up dip position. That is important in basins like the Michigan Basin where the Prairie du Chien has interbedded sandstones and dolomites. And then as we move towards the central part of the production, there is mostly dolomite. And as we go into some of the allocogen settings like uh, the Anadarko Basin, the, the um, Mississippi Embayment, and also a more distal ramp setting, we pick up increasing more limestone. And in some of the positions, we can see interbeds of dolomite in light blue and limestone in darker blue in a more outer ramp setting. And of course, all of these reservoirs that were deposited in various depositional patterns are affected by the, the uh, unconformity, which has a duration of anywhere from a few hundred thousand years to uh, perhaps as much as 10 million years. And this unconformity at the top of these reservoirs, it dissolves them, causes caves, caves that collapse. Uh, there's a lot of diagenesis and fractures associated with this major exposure surface. If we look at where oil and gas pays occur, in the various depositional settings, this diagram helps illustrate that the interbedded sandstones and dolomites, uh, as they play out in an updip scenario, can have multiple pays over, in this case, an example from the Michigan Basin, uh, where there's 900 feet of sand and dolomite, and there are pays at the top. This would be where the unconformity is. But there are pays all the way down and you can get stacked pays. If we look at the mid-dip shelf dolomite setting in the middle, which is where most of the production comes from in the Great American Carbonate Bank, it's clear that whether we're in unconformity traps like those in Kansas or in big structural blocks uh, such as the Permian Basin, Oklahoma, uh, that there are big dolomite reservoirs, but that the pay is basically in the top of the Arbuckle, Ellenberger, Knox, and that the limits of the pay is controlled by the column height. And then when we look in a down dip setting where perhaps it's in an unlockagen like the Anadarko Basin or outer ramp where there are these uh, red circles represent pay in a dolomite setting surrounded by limestone. When we look at the dolomite tongues in an overall limestone horizon, we can find pay. There, there, pay can occur in places like the brown zone uh, in the Anadarko Basin, 900 feet from the Arbuckle Unconformity, because the limestone at the top of the Unconformity down to the uh, brown zone dolomite is tight and is not productive. So it's usually very instructive to understand how hydrocarbons are trapped 